Good evening. Welcome and welcome back to those of you who were here last night. Dr. Ray Grindy is regarded as America's leading Catholic psychologist and family counselor. Dr. Ray is a Catholic father of 10 adopted children, a clinical psychologist, author, professional speaker, and national radio and television host. His radio show, The Doctor Is In, can be heard on over 440 stations and Sirius XM Channel 130 and Catholic Radio here in Oklahoma City on 97.3. His TV show, Living Right with Dr. Ray, can be seen on EWTN Global Catholic Network and is aired in 140 countries. I think he's doing his radio show from uh, the basement of the Pastoral Center tomorrow down at Catholic Radio. Is that true? So at noon, it'll be on at noon. Can we call in? Okay. There you go. From his newest, one of his newest books, Jesus, the Master Psychologist, Listen to Him. He has a quote from C.S. Lewis's book, Man or Rabbit, which says, if Christianity should happen to be true, then it is quite impossible that those who know the truth and those who don't should be equally well equipped for leading a good life. Knowledge of the facts must make a difference to one's actions. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, thank you for giving us the truth. Help our actions to reflect them in all that we do and we say as we come closer to the resurrection of Easter. We ask this through Christ our King, who lives forever and ever, amen. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ray. question I get most often is a shrink. You got any kids? I do. Mentioned last night I have 10. Then I hear this. All right. Now that you got your own kids, what have you learned? I've learned something very critical. I rarely took them out in public. <laughs> you take them out in public, invariably they're going to pull some stunt. Embarrasses the heck out of you. People know you're a shrink, it's worse. Because you can almost hear them thinking out loud, let's just see what Mr. Psycho Man does about this one. But I figure it this way. First nine, ten years of life out in public, they embarrass us. After that, Dad, you embarrass them. Oh, come on, come on, Dad, don't, don't, don't wear the pants with the feathers. Dad, don't wave at me when people are looking right at us and I'm not going to pull your finger. Why do you suppose people seek me out these days? All settings, family, therapy, friends, church, school. 80% of the time that a parent wants to talk to me, this is why. Discipline. Okay, Mr. Expert Man. You tell me how to get him to stay in bed. I can't get him to stay in bed. Chews his way down through the bedroom floor. Drops into the family room. I'm back. You'll never be free. You'll never have another child. I'll be in your bed till I'm 16. That's why. And that girl's mouth, that snotty, snarly, you know, if I'd have talked to my parents that way, my head would have been rolling down the hallway. And the school people, they don't help. You know what they did last year? They closed during June, July, and August. I actually had to live with my own child during the daytime. Now, many of you have raised your children. You look around you, do you think to yourself, what's going on out there? You know, you have nine kids. Now, I know what you hear. They practically gag. I can't handle the two that I have. You know what you do when somebody says to you, are these all your children? You say, oh, of course not. The oldest is at home with the triplets. <laughs> hmm. 
Many of you have raised your children, and I believe that generation above me was the last generation to know who the parent was. You parented out of the mindset, I am dad, you are not. Nowadays, we got these young people so messed up, you leave him on the pot for four minutes too long, he's going to grow up to be a tattooed face motorcycle gang member on Springer. You named him John because you were hoping it would help in the toilet training. <laughs> I was three years old when I said this to my mom. I don't like you. She looked at me. Raymond, you're a little behind. I stopped liking you last year. <laughs> that was back before you could psychologically smack parents around, you know. One of my kids tells me I don't like you. So what? I got five or six who do. Any given moment, I got a 50% approval rating. Parents will say to me, all right, this discipline thing, this is tough. Do you have a technique to make it easier? I do. I developed it. This is the best technique I have ever seen for disciplining a kid or a grandkid less. It's foolproof. All you have to do is one thing. Lower your standards. Get them low enough, you don't have to discipline at all. I told you, quit doing drugs in the living room when we have company. We discipline because we love. No matter what generation you are, because if we don't do it now, because you're tired, or you feel guilty, or you think he won't like you, or your mother-in-law already thinks you are the biggest she-witch to fly the face of the earth, we are turning our kids and grandkids over to those people out there. I guarantee you every kid and grandkid in here will get disciplined. The question is, by whom? We don't, they will. A judge, a landlord, an army sergeant, a police officer, an employer. I shudder at this next one, a wife. Somebody's going to teach them, and the world hurts, I tell folks. Discipline without love may be harsh. Love without discipline is child abuse. Because ultimately, that child is going to get hurt real bad out there by a world who doesn't give mitigating circumstances. Some employer is not about to say, you are just so cranky. Now, did you get a nap today? You go home and you rest up till you're ready to come back. There's an interesting phenomenon that occurs in my office. A parent will come in and describe a litany of trouble about this long. Then they'll say this, you know, I think I'm giving you the wrong impression. Overall, he's a pretty good kid. And I'll ask him, how is that? Well, he's not on drugs or anything like that. One of the new moral high bars, he's not on drugs. I ask my clients, what do you want looking back at you at age 22? What would you hope to be able to say? No guarantees, but hope about that child at age 22. If you're content to say, you know, uh, Given the way kids are turning out nowadays, I'm counting my blessings. Parole officer says one of the nicest kids he has. I tell him, you don't have to parent that hard. Parent like those folks out there. You'll probably have a kid not on drugs. But if you wish to look at that child at 22 and say something like this, I'm not real objective. I'm his mother, but I think he's one in a hundred. Morals, character, compassion, seeks God. He's a beautiful human being then I challenge them. Are you prepared to be a one in a hundred parent, one in a hundred grandparent? You can't do this like them anymore, folks. They'll take you places you don't want to go. They supervise here, they think they're strict. They should be supervising here. They're giving out social freedom two, three, four years too early. Technological freedom four, five, six years too early. And you know what's interesting? You won't be understood. You'll be critiqued. You'll be questioned. You'll be second-guessed, oftentimes by the very people all around you. Many of you have raised great kids. And you went against that culture to do it, and you don't get credit for it. You are so lucky. You just have good kids. You have chastity and Angelica. I didn't get good kids. I got Chucky, Damien, Cujo, and Lucifer. 
like it was the luck of the draw, you know? The experts don't think like you folks. Go to the computer, type in child, self-esteem, search. Last I looked, over a hundred million options. The experts believe self-esteem is the preeminent moral virtue, even though research says it's not related to much of anything. Type in child humility search. A fraction. When's the last time you heard an expert talk about humility? But humility is at the very center of Christian virtues. My humility is something I'm very proud of. <laughs> My newest book out there. Humility is what made me great. <laughs> Can you imagine our Lord going up to the apostles? Simon, you know, there for a while I toyed with changing your name to Peter, but I decided against it. I didn't know what that would do to your self-image, okay? You've always seen yourself as a Simon. I go changing your identity to Peter now, rock. You know, but I'll tell you what. I've talked to my father. And he and I agree, you have a future in this operation. If you can conceive it, you can believe it. If you can believe it, you can achieve it. Twelve more weeks of Tony Robbins management courses. Simon, you'll run this outfit. I don't think so. I always wanted to go to confession like the politicians. Bless me, Father. Mistakes were made. And I would like to apologize if God took something I did out of context, misinterpreted it, and became offended by it. I'm sorry for his misunderstanding. My children are, at one point, were 12, 11, 10, 10, 9, 7, 4, 3, 2, and baby. Now, my 10 children are all adopted. And I know I was talking to some young folks back here. You know what the great thing about adoption? The agencies don't tell you this. I figured it out about the fourth kid. If you adopt in December, you still get the tax deduction for the whole year. Yeah, they pay for themselves the first year. Then you start to fall behind because they eat more. But if you cut back on the food, you can break even September, October. Now, my wife and I have had this ongoing conflict, and it's got worse as we got more children. And ladies, I believe you'll agree with me. First of all, my wife does not work for a living. I don't know what she does. <laughs> You quote me, I'll deny I was even here. I've seen what the woman does. I want no part of what the woman does. When the kids were little, she'd take them to the grocery store. I'd go. If I was heavily sedated, I would go. You have to see it. Strung out behind her like ducks, hands at their side. Not a lot of touching thing. They would not deviate six inches either way out of a straight line the whole three hours they were in there. No, they wouldn't. Leg irons wouldn't let them. I got three white kids, two Hispanic kids, two biracial kids, three black kids. People would look at my wife. Some of them were pretty bold. Is this some kind of club or something? Some of them wouldn't say a whole lot, but I could read their eyes. That major dork don't realize them ain't all his. I suspect her, but I can't catch her. I have five boys and five estrogen Americans. <laughs> now, one of the most common adjectives leveled at children these days, and it bespeaks of our loss of authority, is this. He is so strong-willed. Very high maintenance, youngster. Very high maintenance. Challenging child. Very challenging child. Seven. Seven gone on 17. Seven gone on 17. Difficult child. The pediatrician told us we have a difficult child. Dear people, difficult child is redundant. My 10 kids have what the experts would call risk factors. Now, we have a young lady I was talking to it here, and she's getting her master's in counseling. A risk factor is anything that would make a kid tougher to raise. 
poor prenatal care, poor postnatal care, abuse in the womb, neglect in the womb, high maternal stress, low birth weights, heavy drug exposure, crack, narcotics, barbiturates, heroin, cocaine, nicotine, marijuana, alcohol. My son Peter, birth mom was told, you're pregnant, don't worry about it. There's a blood clot growing next to the baby. Baby grows, blood clot grows, blood clot wins, suffocates baby, problem solved. The problem made it. Paul called me just half an hour ago. He was born two months premature, one month intensive care, but Petey made it. My daughter Elizabeth, Elizabeth. First mom got pregnant in the seventh grade, went to Akron, Ohio to solve her problem. She didn't realize she was in her seventh month. You know, in the seventh month, that baby's bigger. You can't flush them out, suck them out. You've got to pull them out, and they don't come out in one piece. You have to crush their skull and rip their limbs off. That's the only way you get them out. And I love, well, I shouldn't say love, but it's interesting when I talk to groups that are not like you. You're a pro-life group. Many of the groups I talk to are not pro-life. At best, they're amateur life. And I want, yeah, you're not paying for this. <laughs> and I watch their faces. They get hostile. They don't want to hear this, but this is the truth. That's how you got to get them out. And that little 13-year-old girl didn't realize that, and she left. She called us the next day. We were not expecting a 10th kid. We thought we were done at 9. I guess you could say Lizzie was an unplanned adoption. We weren't practicing safe phone. My son Samuel, two weeks before due date, 35-year-old birth mom was told something is terribly wrong. Can we test? Tentative diagnosis, corpus callosum, agenesis. That is a severe neurological birth defect. Worst case scenario, that's institution for life. Now you gotta figure everybody in that birth mom's world was against her having this kid. Hey, personally I'm opposed to this too. But this is why we do this kind of testing. The child's gonna have no quality of life here, okay? He's gonna be in an institution. Can you protect him in an institution? Do you know what those people get paid? Do you think, do you think they're gonna care about your son? You gotta do the right thing. She did. She gave birth to Sammy. Sammy's 29. He goes by Sergeant G at Fort Hood. It was a shadow on the ultrasound. The test was totally inaccurate. So my kids have this confluence of developmental yuck, gunk, that, that should make them harder to raise and slower to socialize and more impulsive and more immature. I got some like that. But I wouldn't consider any of my children strong-willed. This dude is one toke over the line, sweet Moses. How could you have ten kids under those circumstances not consider any of them strong will? There's a simple explanation. The strongest willed of my children is not stronger willed than his mother. We got so many strong willed kids out there, dear people, because the big people have lost will. We're not sure of ourselves. We're not as confident. I learned a lot of psychology from my father. My father went to God before I was born. Excuse me, Lord. I'm going to raise a whole bunch of kids. I don't want to complicate the whole affair. Give me eight or ten phrases. I'll just repeat them over and over. Dads are not as versatile as moms. I finally figured out why that is. You know how moms have to go to Lama's classes to learn how to be moms? <laughs> she's, she's looking at me like, did I leave the iron on? <laughs> Dads must go to La Paz classes. First time I heard this when I was three years old. You're going to cry? I'm going to give you something to cry about. First father ever to fling that one around. Raymond, you go get me something to spank you with. <laughs> but fathers are generous people. We won't get credit for it. My dad was always giving me something. Dad, I... I can't shovel the snow. I got a bellyache. Raymond, I'm going to give you a bellyache. Do you know what I about his father? He's always giving you something. Where's my master's level counselor? She, she was here just a second ago. Where are you, honey? Did she leave? I thought she was here. 
Okay. Well, see, in counseling, they tell you how to use I messages, not you messages. My father was 20 years ahead of I messages. He would take nouns and change them into verbs on my head. Dad, I got peanut butter on your vice grips. Raymond, I'm going to peanut butter your head. It was always some I message up here. Now, you're not going to find I'm going to peanut butter your head in any discipline book. I have looked. It is not there. By today's enlightened psychological standards, my father was a parenting barbarian, a Neanderthal. Judge it by the acid question. Not was he psychologically correct. You know, dear people, a culture's in big trouble when psychological correctness is replacing moral correctness. When more people are asking, is it normal? Rather than, is it right? Perfectly normal for a three-year-old to melt down fit on you. It's not good. 14-year-olds, they'll get snotty and disrespectful if you let them. It's not right. The question is not, is it normal? Sin is normal. For my dad, he asked this question, how well will this work to help me teach the moral lesson I wish to teach my child in my home with my deepest held beliefs and not with some shrink thinks I should teach him? For pop, 50%. That's sky high with discipline. How's he doing it? Two things. He loved me desperately. And I know whether you're a parent or a grandparent in here, you love those kids desperately. That is why I do not get in front of groups like this and say, you need to be more positive, more active listening. Five plus statements for every neutral statement for maximum self-esteem results. How many stickers per square inch on your sticker system? <laughs> Most of you are very good at doing that. You know, it's a second part of the equation that is now giving even the best of parents fits. When my dad said to me, Raymond, I asked you once, leave your sister alone. Have a seat. Don't get up till I tell you. I had a seat. I'll tease my clients sometimes. What would your mother have said had you talked to her the way your daughter is talking to you? <laughs> no, I didn't. Why not? You were a teenage girl once. I may have felt like it, but I didn't do it very often. Why? I knew. You knew what? Something would happen. What? I don't know. Why don't you know? It never happened. Why didn't it happen? I never did it. Why didn't you do it? Something would have happened. What? I don't know. Who's on first? I don't know. Third page! It's an Abbott and Costello routine, but you see what it speaks of, dear people. I call it the perception of authority. Remember the look? Many of you older parents in here had the look. You look at a kid, now he looks back at you like, what are you looking at? You want a piece of this? I used to sit in church, and my dad would bounce the look down the pew on our heads. And by the time it got to me, it still had enough juice left in it that I wet myself. <laughs> so I'd get up, and I'd go to communion. I'd come back, and I'd stand. Now, if you're going to look holy, you've got to go like this and tilt your head. And I'd stand right at the edge of the pew, and I'd let my sisters go in. And the Italian Catholic ladies would be thinking, look at that, look at that. He is going to be a priest. Look at, no, no, skip priest, go straight to cardinal. That's what he's, that wasn't it. I'm not going to sit the rest of mass in urine. <laughs> the look is dead. Six of my kids, we got at infancy. Four we got later. The twins had a pretty rough history. Birth mom ingested every toxin she could get a hold of. We don't know where they were the first year and a half of their lives. Children's services finally caught up to her. Placed them in a foster care setting. The foster parents were sweet people, but they didn't discipline them. They felt guilty. Remember what I said about love without discipline is child abuse because the world will punish you? We've since found out that my son and daughter, John and Joanna, had a chance to be adopted prior to us. Two families picked before us. We had four kids at the time. They weren't looking at us. Both families backed out. They met the kids. Ooh, no, we were, we were hoping for something a, a little more along the lines of a child. <laughs> you see what I mean about discipline by the world, dear people? That little four-year-old boy and girl lost a mommy and a daddy. Twice. Third time if you count the bio parent. Why? Because of their conduct. Why? 
because the big people met him and said, I don't want any part of you. You're warped. Now, I got to admit, it didn't look too good. First visit there, Johnny punches me in the face, attempts to strangle my wife, kicks the foster father about 14 times during one of his multiple eruptions. We walked out of there, and my wife was just ticking. She was going, jeez. And she said to me, Ray, we got to rethink this. I don't think the tax deduction is worth it, honey. <laughs> Two tax deductions plus the credits. They never made John go to bed. First weekend visit to our house, my weasel wife says, Raymond, why don't you put the children to bed tonight? Honey, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you do it. I, I don't have time for that. I'm writing a parenting book. <laughs> All right, guys, come on, let's go. Heading for bed. Now, everybody came around except Johnny. He just stood there. No, go bed. Okay, I'm not a big guy. But I'm 170 pounds, and I've been a weightlifter all my life. And one thing I know for certain, I am still stronger than the biggest, baddest four-year-old in the whole world. <laughs> the child is going to bed. The question is, under whose power? So I went over, and I bent down. You know, kind of like the veterinarians tell you, don't tower over a wild animal, let him smell your hand. And I put my hands on his shoulders, and he could tell by my grip this was how shall we say, a non-negotiable psychological interface. <laughs> now, at that point, he erupts. Head starts spinning around, green stuff's coming out. I'm going, Damien, put the chainsaw down, Damien. <laughs> he starts leaking out of every body orifice. Now, Father, I don't know if this is theologically sound or not, but I think that this is why God put holes in them, so you could leak off the pressure. You know, <laughs> most of them leak up here, but you can get leakers down here. You can and sometimes you get pukers. Now, the interesting thing about a puker is that they usually develop out of it by a year or two. They can't get themselves so upset anymore. Their delicate digestive system, they don't throw up. But wouldn't it be great, wouldn't it be great if you still could? He picks you up on the first date. You're not real crazy about the guy. So he says, can I call you again? You don't say a word. You go over to his passenger door and you just go, <laughs> Now, even he could understand that nonverbal. <laughs> Johnny wasn't going to go to bed. So I picked him up. I bent down. I put him up over my head, off to the side, because he's dripping. And I carried him to bed. I put him in bed, and I put my hands on his chest, and he could not move. It was, mm. Now, I didn't hurt him. We already said prayers. We already brushed teeth. We already did the bedtime ritual. I said, Johnny, it's bedtime, son. Daddy's not going to let you roam the house. Because he roamed the house for two and a half years. He was dangerous. Daddy's not going to let you roam the house till I decide you're going to stay in bed. And please don't get up after I leave. Because I'll come back. You should have seen the look in his face. Oh, man, I went from Disney World to the county jail. My son Andrew was six years old at the time. He's in the top bunk watching the scenario. Andrew, would you, would you please talk to your brother? Johnny, if Dad says go to bed, you better go to bed. I remember one time I didn't go to bed. You're not going to like what's going to happen. You know that, Johnny? You think he's going to leave? He doesn't leave, Johnny. He goes out in the hallway, and he just stands there, and he waits. And then if you come out, he's going to crack your bottom. He don't care what the caseworker says. Andrew, that's enough. You sound like Mom. Now, how long do you think I had to hold that boy because, before he went? <sighs> it was under a minute. Now, is that because I'm such a great disciplinarian? No. My wife's a far better disciplinarian than I am. It was perception. Had the foster parents tried that, he'd have fought them for hours because his perception was, don't try it. Don't try it. No authority. We've been through this dance for two and a half years. Don't even think of this. He didn't quite know how to read me. He knew I was going to be daddy. We'd visited many times. Plus, not to take any chances. I put a tattoo right there. It said, bored to kick butt. <laughs> Some of you may have uh, little grandchildren, five-year-olds, or you may have children yourself that are that age, and 
A test that I give parents, I'll say, if you told that child one time in a calm tone of voice, that was mean, go stand in the corner, please. Would he? Now, the average American parent and grandparent can't get that to happen. Not without a brawl, not without coming out of the corner 26 times, not without a meltdown, not without a fit, not without nagging from the corner. How do they do it? Simple technique. Here's what I tell parents. You say it one time. And I'm, this works for any age, by the way. Any age, any discipline. Say it one time. As soon as you get resistance, as soon as you get an argument, as soon as you start getting 27 why, 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 as soon as they come out of the room, as soon as they refuse to write the essay, whatever it is, blackout. Blackout is complete, total cessation of every perk and privilege that your hands accept. Some kinds of food, love, maybe the bathroom. Grandpa, I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch the TV, huh? No, no, honey, you, you're not watching anything, not until I get my corner first. Chocolate Sunday with nuts, Grandma. Chocolate Sunday with nuts. Okay, good idea. We're going to drive through McDonald's. Sarah's going to get a chocolate Sunday with nuts. You're going to watch. I haven't gotten my corner yet. Favorite cup, gone. Favorite shirt, gone. Favorite toys, gone. Stuffed animals, gone. All privileges, gone. Outside, gone. Technology, gone. Every single thing. This can go all the way up the age scale until you get that cooperation. Because what happens is, if you can't get a child to accept discipline, you go to father. Bless, bless me, father. You know, before I had children, I was pretty nice. Now I'm not pretty or nice. Um, and I just have one question. Okay, um, how grievous a sin would it be to want to shoot a child with a bazooka? Okay, now, is that serious? You know, I don't want, I just want it over his head. I don't really want to hit him. I just want to go over his head. This is what happens. We get nasty. We get ugly. You want to have that calm discipline that you can enforce. Now, I wouldn't put him in the corner yet because he'll just fall over, okay? You know, you, and don't try to make him write an essay, okay? Well, you could do that. Yeah, a lot of, I'll tell you what, a lot of parents will do that. When they have a three-year-old who won't, they'll strap him in a car seat. And you spend the time in the car seat. And then, then, when I let you out of the car seat, then you go to the corner. Because your original consequence was the corner. It wasn't the car seat. The car seat is just making the corner stick. Then you come out, then you go to the corner, or you sit on the steps, or you put your head down at the dining room table. Now, don't mishear me. You can get carried away. My dad got carried away. He said things that made me neurotic. Raymond, you shut your mouth and eat. I'll teach you to backtalk your mother, young man. Come on, Dad, I already know how. <laughs> I'll show you to hit your brother. <laughs> Go ahead. You fall out of that tree, break both your legs, Buster, don't come running to me. <laughs> now, my mother's discipline philosophy was a shade different. My mother's philosophy was, you never say in seven words what you can say in 60 seven thousand I'd be in the backyard oblivious to my mother trying to get me in the house for supper when the torrent of words would begin Raymond Nicholas Garendi how many times are you gonna make me call you buster you know buddy boy you seem to think I talk just to hear myself talk you seem to think I like the sound of my own voice. I'm going to tell you something. You better listen, and you better listen good, because I'm not going to say it again. I was not put on this earth to serve you. There are five other people in this house. You think you can evolve our schedule around yours? You come waltz here, plock your bucket down when you're darn good and ready. Mom, feed me now. I'm hungry. And I'm going to get up for what I'm doing. you got another thing coming, Buster. You mark my words, there's going to be some changes around here, because I am sick and I am tired. I have just about had you up to here. You don't really, you look at me when I talk to you. Don't you look at me like that. <laughs> now, I never moved because she wasn't mad enough yet. Now, my mother's philosophy was, if the first 30,000 didn't get you anywhere, double it. You think you got it tough? I am going to tell you what tough is. When I was a little girl, I used to walk 18 miles, uphill both ways to school in a foot of nuclear waste, with no shoes, 
We had one pair that glowed for 14 brothers and sisters. My turn only came out every two weeks. I always gave my turn away. That's the kind of girl I was. I got at 5 o'clock in the morning, two hours before we were even allowed to go to bed. <laughs> Split a cornflake for breakfast. So they brothers carried them to school in my back, did their home along, along the way. And you know what? I was grateful for what little I had. What'd you have, Mom? Nothing! You're listening? But we were happy children. What are our kids and grandkids going to tell their kids? 550 channels, that's all we got when I was a boy. Used to have to make your sister go get the remotes for her when I was a boy. Only had nine of them, power buttons up there at the top. Had to stretch your thumb like I get that top power button. Sometimes you hurt stuff right in here, you know? Uh, one winter got so bad. After my mom done shoving the driveway, she only made it halfway up the walk where she collapsed. I had to step over her with my hot chocolates. I spilled some right there, should have sued her. My dad never said a word, his discipline kicked in. This is not psychologically correct. The experts would be revulsed. Did it work for Pop? Because he loved me. Because he meant it. And because I thought he didn't know how to use verbs yet. Hey! Dad, I wash my clothes cards and rake the leaves. I had a big wet spot right here, you know. We are a microwave culture. We want results. We want them now. We want them certainly. I fall prey to this. I get up in the morning. I put my mug in the microwave. I punch in 60 seconds. And then about the 32nd mark, I'm doing this. Oh, come on. What's with this thing? I haven't got all minute. Let's go. This has impacted discipline. How long is this going to take? I've tried everything with this child. Nothing works. Finally, I got so frustrated, I sent him next door to play, moved the family while he was gone. See, along the way, we got impatient. We want change now. And if we had the right psychological technique, this should have been better by now. I got a question for you folks. You still sinning? Well, come on, you're a lot older than the kid. How come you're still doing this? We expect a kid after four weeks of gone to the corner. Oh, mother, I've just been so blind. I see what you're saying. That's why you're the grown-up. I'm the child. It's all so clear to me now. Let's hold hands, sing Kumbaya around the campfire. Give peace a chance. Alexander, Bell, you guys embarrass me when I'm on the phone. You know that? People call here, I sound like a crazed lunatic. We have a new house rule. From this point forward, when I get on the phone, you please be respectful. No interrupting, and that includes this. <laughs> I'm gonna excuse myself from the call. I'm going to put you in your rooms for the rest of the call. Please don't come out. I'll ground you for the day. I'll come and get you when I'm ready. Now, my clients will say to me, okay, how many times I got to do this? I'll say, well, uh, maybe 15, 35, 85. I have no idea that'll be $80. And you know, folks, it doesn't matter. I always tell my clients, I can give you lots of ideas. You know what I can't give you? I can't give you the will to do it. That's where it breaks down for most of us. You won't get away with this. <clears throat> oh, hello, Father Rex. How are you? <laughs> okay, we would be flattered to be the role model family for the church children love in. Father, could you just excuse me for one second, please? Yeah, I'm going to have a little love chat with the children. <laughs> They're precious blessings from God. You know, we love them desperately. Wish we had 13 or 14 of them. <laughs> yeah, they're getting antsy. We're half hour past rosary circle. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we still pray it on our knees in broken glass in Aramaic, <laughs> except when we're levitating. <laughs> okay, fa okay, Father Rex, thank you. Thank you for the call. We would be flattered. Pe I'll get him on the extension. Peace to you, Father. Harmony, Aquarius. Okay, just... <laughs> Just one second. You're going to die. I'm going to rip your tongue out of your throat, wrap it around the fence with a buzzer to pick at you, little maggot. Get away from her. 
What's that, Father? No, that's a neighbor lady. Mm -hmm. She's been talking to her kids like that for years. We, we do pray for her, Father, but I don't think she'll come. We could ask her, but she won't come. She doesn't like kids. Now, a culture says, why? Will you please explain to me why that person is acting that way? Part of fallen human nature is we don't begin the search here. You know, I don't see kids. I see their parents. I see their grandparents. I see their aunts, their uncles. I see the grown-ups. I don't see the kid. I'm not going to get some seven-year-old to go, uh, Dr. Ray, might you give me some impulse control strategies where I might uh, develop some kind of maturity in difficult social environments? That's not going to happen. You've got to deal with the big people. Un unfortunately, because we don't like to look this way first, we look this way. Let me give you some of the more common this ways. Letter overload. Here's how it works. Take a kid. Don't love them. Don't discipline them. Don't give them stability. From malignant neglect to permissive, spoiled, rotten, self-centered indulgence. You know, some children by their nature need this much parenting. Some in the same family need this much. If you're not going up to where you need to go to socialize and moralize this child, they can get very ugly, nasty, aggressive, defiant, belligerent, conscienceless pieces of conduct. Then all too often a guy like me does this. Yeah, I've, uh, I've assessed the child. I've, I've determined the child is a bit disordered. The child has letters. The child has ODD. ADD, ADHD, LSMFT, IRS, EIEIO. I start flinging letters all over him. ODD, oppositional defiant disorder. It's not a disorder. It's a summary label for a lot of bad behavior. ADD, ADHD, two separate etiological conditions, tail end of the temperamental continuum. But folks, it's my contention, and there's research backing me up on this now, these letters are pouring down on our children in obscene quantities. I was talking to a guy not so long ago, I was doing a teacher in service, and he told me in his previous school he taught, uh, I think it was ninth and 10th grade, and he had 26 kids in his class. 23 were on medication. 23. When the big people don't do what the big people need to do, the little people start to reflect it. When the little people start to reflect it, the big people turn around and, why are you like this? What's wrong with him? You see why he's so aggressive, impulsive, immature, defiant? My son John got him at four. He had enough letters after his name, he could have spelled another couple of names, none of which have really panned out except the letters I gave him. All this many years later, he's still got traces of this. I diagnosed him. Behaviorally regressive, Attitudinal trauma. That's an IQ joke. Let's see which of you got that. B-R-A-T. Hey, we're going to have to start separating them according to IQ tomorrow night there, Father. Well, what about diet? Now, isn't that a big one? Diet, cut out anything red. Cut out anything sweet. Cut out anything artificial. Cut out anything that remotely tastes good. Give them a dry cracked wheat brown berry tofuti sandwich on bean sprouts. And this kid will get better mess scores, kiss his sister on the lips, and paints murals on the church ceiling. <laughs> now, there's only one problem with diet. Doesn't have a whole lot of research support. Oh, it's good for health and nutrition. Our kids' diets are atrocious. And for whatever the reason, there are more systemic allergies out there. We don't know why. But the idea that if I eat this, I'm going to act like this has a weak link. That notion has been swallowed whole by our culture. He went to that party last night. He had three Reese's peanut butter cups, two cans of Mountain Dew, and a Kit Kat. He came home and torched the dog. Now, I told those people, no Kit Kat. It was the Kit Kat. Probably not. Birth order. Middle child syndrome. I tell parents, you're not afraid of middle child syndrome. Don't have an odd number of kids. 
See, you guys got nine, right? You got a middle kid. But you know, over the years, you've had several middle kids. So I don't know how long you got to be a middle kid to get middle child syndrome, you know? Can you have acute middle child syndrome, residual middle child syndrome? Is this your first one? You know, if you have a second one, the baby will have latent middle child syndrome. Because if you have a third, then he or she will be the middle child. The truth on birth order is this. It only holds one place a little bit. Oldest only. As a group, a little more independent, a little more achieving. Maybe they develop a shade quicker. I don't think that's their position. We all change our styles. The first kid, you boiled everything she came within 50 feet of. Last kid, you throw him this big dirt ball and say, here, chew on that. Wipe your mouth off in a gas can before you come in the house. First kid, dual videotape of every burp and bowel movement he ever had. Last kid, one snapshot at the birth, one at the wedding rehearsal dinner. Hey, Dad, how come I got no pictures? It's not true, son. Your sister did a popsicle stick sketch in kindergarten. Besides, you look like your sister. Use her picture. First kid, you sneak into his room every night. You stick a mirror underneath his nostrils. Make sure he's still breathing. Last kid, you tell the dog, get out of the crib. <laughs> don't lick him in the face. No, I was talking to the baby. You don't know where that mouse been. <laughs> Poor dog. Somebody asked my wife when our ninth one, Peter, was about two, three months old. Petey sleeping through the night yet? My wife said, I don't know if he is. We are. Uh, you know, you kind of get to that point. <laughs> and you grandparents are treacherous people. You truly are treacherous people. Because you lurk, you lie in wait for us to have children who do to us what we did to you. My mother was at our house some years ago in the kitchen, sitting there saying nothing. My mother is 100% Italian. If she doesn't ask me if I'm hungry every eight seconds, she is seriously depressed. Ma, what are you thinking? Well, Ray, I'll tell you what I'm thinking. I'm thinking you and Randy are getting very sloppy in your parenting. Huh? Elizabeth gets away with murder. Now, at that time, Lizzie was the youngest. She was seven. The other kids try any of this stuff, you stop them dead in their tracks. Lizzie, you take a picture and you put it in a Christmas card. Mom, wait a minute now. Lizzie doesn't take much discipline. Lizzie is a very cooperative child. I'll give you an example. Last night I noticed it was about half hour past her bedtime. It was about 3 a.m. <laughs> All I had to say, Elizabeth, bedtime please. Immediate cooperation. She took out her cigarette. She put it in the ashtray. You know, the other kids flick their butts on the floor, not Lizzie. In the ashtray. Tell me I'm getting sloppy in my parenting. We're very different. I talked about this last night a little bit. You know, if you have boys and girls, they're very, very different. Boys are simpler creatures. You know, the world is our bathroom. I mean, that's really pretty simple. You ladies, you're, you're so observant, you know? You, you, you are, and I... When, when have we guys ever done this to our buddies? Hey, yo, yo, Max, rock. Hey, uh... You guys notice anything different about me? I mean, I've been around a long time, and I have yet to say to one of my buddies, Hey, Leo, cute top. <laughs> We're just different. When I was in grad school, they told us, no difference, just socialized into different roles, that's all. Give a little girl a front end loader, she'll grow up to be a special ops tank commando. Give a little boy a baby doll, he'll grow up to be a nurturant preschool teacher. 50% of little boys will immediately rip the head off that baby doll and turn it into a machine gun. <laughs> We're wired different from the get-go. God says it, human history says it, the research says it. And you know, kids want you to think they're savvy because 
Two generations ago, you couldn't psychologically bully parents. You couldn't manipulate them. Now, okay, you can make me do what you want. I used to do this to my mom. Fine, you make me do what you want. Now, when I'm 18, I'm going to do the exact opposite of everything you ever taught me. You can make me go to bed now. When I'm 18, I'm never gone to bed. So you know what I do? For years, I called her up 3.30 in the morning. Mom, yeah, I'm still awake. You know what else? I got every light in the house on. <laughs> Refrigerator doors wide open. I just drank straight from the milk carton. Later on, I'm going to run with the scissors. Yeah, the good scissors. Remember the good scissors? Well, I, I used to go home and I go, hey, Ma, you still got those good scissors? They were up in a shrine glass case next to the scotch tape and the virgin. They were, the one, they were rusted shut. Remember the ones we had? They were rusted shut. You touched them, you got tetanus. My mother would always say, you don't cut paper with the good scissors. Psychological correctness is a quagmire. You will overthink, you'll overanalyze, you'll second guess yourself. And you know something, dear people? Most of you are countercultural. It is very easy, well, it's not very easy. It is much easier to raise a civilized child, one not on drugs, than it is to raise a virtuous child. That takes a lot more vigilance, a lot more resolve, a lot more strength and a lot more realizing you're going to get badgered by that culture out there, by and large, doesn't think like you do. If my kids go astray, I want it to be because they had to go through me, not because I stepped aside. I can live with myself if they have to go through me. I don't know if I could live with myself if I just said, well, okay. Take a few questions, usually with the parenting question. The marriage question is like last night. Nobody wanted to ask a marriage question because, uh, especially for a guy, you ask a marriage question, your, guy, your wife goes, why are you asking a question? You don't need to ask a question. You are happy. I told you, you are happy. <laughs> Do what the women tell you. Nobody gets hurt. But if you have a question, grandparent, parent question, we got a few minutes left, just a few minutes. I do have the books out there, a lot of them on discipline, a lot of them on marriage. Uh, Jesus, uh, Master Psychologist, the most recent book. Uh, I have some on when faith causes family friction, when you get in trouble for being, being a little too Catholic with your relatives and your adult children and everyone else. And I have books on the faith and everything there uh, comes with a Springer guarantee. Your children and grandchildren will never be on Jerry Springer, you know. <laughs> Unless that's from a past life, I can't do anything about that. Yes, ma'am. Yes. My teen book is right now in between printings. However, I have two books that would relate to that. One is called Discipline That Lasts a Lifetime. It's my most popular discipline book. It is the most common discipline questions I get asked ages 2 to 18. The other book is Advice Worth Ignoring. It is 50 pieces of common expert notions that undercut you, that undercut your resolve. Okay, so I have, I have both of those books available. Yes, ma'am, mother of nine. They're not on drugs. The three-year-olds are not on drugs? Okay, good. Good start. You'll never be free. They'll always be there. Oh, 
this is good. You didn't. I'm going to get into that. I'm going to get into that. You ask really two levels of question. My wife said to me one time, I don't like who our younger kids are hanging around with. They're a bad influence. And I said, honey, I'm afraid I agree with you. Unfortunately, they're, they're their older brothers and sisters. <laughs> so that is a problem. One time I had to tell one of my sons that you will no longer be allowed to come to family gatherings if you try to pull the younger kids aside and influence them. Now, we told him, don't do that, and he ignored us. So we told him, if you do this, we're going to ask you to leave. Because he'd pull them aside and chirp, chirp in their ear, you know, how mom or dad are unfair, or, you know, how he's decided religion isn't all that important anymore. He's chirping in their ear. He said, there will be none of that. So that's the first thing I would say. I, you have a very strong red line. You can't do this to your younger kids. I won't let you do this. I'll kick you out. Now, here's the bigger question. And this is the number one question I now get. What do you do with these 18, 20, 22, 25, 32, 35, 37-year-olds still living in your house? And the problem is they're not cooperative. If they were cooperative, that'd be one thing. I, my 26-year-old son, my oldest, he lived in our house until he was 26, and he went to college, and he was very cooperative, very respectful, very pleasant. Hey, Andrew, you can live here all you want. My son, Petey, he's 25. He's been coming around now. He moved out to his own apartment to finish college. He's back, and we love him. We love him there. He's respectful. But I kicked two out because they weren't. You know, just because you're 19 or 20 or 22 and you think you can do whatever you want, whenever you want, coming in whenever you want, talking however you want, watching whatever you want, that's not going to happen. And so we, dis we have to make a decision. By the way, most parents won't do that, and I'll tell you why. They're afraid. They're afraid. If I put a condition on this kid, if I basically say, for you to live here, this is my conditions. This is what you got to do. They're afraid that if the kid is forced to leave, he'll crash and burn. He'll get into drugs. He'll hang with a bad crowd. He'll move in with his girlfriend, whatever. He'll totally neglect the faith. And I say, well, that, that is your decision. You have to make that decision. My wife said this once. You can't be a good parent without a bit of a mean streak in you. And she didn't mean harshness. She meant resolve. In other words, if you can't make tough decisions that you know in the long run are probably going to be better than letting this kid live here for three, four, five, six, seven years, and it's ugly and it's unpleasant and he's in, uncooperative and he hasn't looked for a job and you keep giving him stuff to apply for a job and somehow he applies but he doesn't apply and then he gets fired from two jobs and he comes back home and it's just this kind of, this kind of existence, you have to ask yourself one question. Am I helping him? That's the question. And here's what usually happens. The parents who won't do this, and by the way, I see a lot of conflict between husband and wife. One of them wants to. The other one doesn't. So what happens is this. Typically, if it goes on too long, it ends really ugly. It ends really ugly. By time they've both had enough, the relationship is so fractured and fragmented that they can't wait to get this kid out of here, and he won't talk to him for two years because he's so mad at him because this went on so long. My one son was 18 when I asked him to leave. And we're on good terms now. He's 27. We have good, and he never even was estranged from us even then, but that's what I had to do. He did something. He took my car without permission. Sorry, James, you can't do that. Okay, so yeah, that's, that's real common stuff I'm getting nowadays, a lot of that stuff. Sir?
That is a very large societal question that I don't even wrestle with anymore because it's very clear. If you wish to raise a God-seeking child, you're going to be in a minority. It's that simple. So I, I don't have the book here. It's called Raising Upright Kids in an Upside-Down World. It's sold out. But basically, it talks about all of that, all the forces that more or less telling your kids why your parents are dumb, why your parents don't know what they're talking about, why your parents are stuck in yesterday's morals, all of that. And as a parent, you better be vigilant. As a grandparent, you better be vigilant. You can't know what they're even going to see on television on a decent movie because they're, they're, they're filling it up with woke stuff now, left and right all over the place. You know, I, this is about as much TV as I've watched here because I have the days free and, and I just finished a recent book a couple days ago, so I'm not writing anything. <sighs> the commercials. <laughs> the commercials are just pushing society's view on you like you don't know. And they're just relentless in doing it. You know, they're subtle and they're good, boy. They're really good. So you just have to be much more vigilant. I talked about this last night. I'll just touch it briefly. You want an enemy that will undercut your parenting, your grandparenting? Give them a smartphone. That's it. Give them a smartphone. That'll do it. That will totally pull them. So be very careful about that stuff. And I usually tell parents, the only kids that I know who have not misused that smartphone, by and large, are kids you haven't caught yet. I know that's a scary thought. About the only influence you can have, especially in a distance where you see them twice a year, three times a year, they just got to see who you are. They got to see that grandma's a lady I can talk to. They got to see that grandma listens to me. Grandma pays attention to me. Grandpa spends time with me. That's what they got to see. They got to see a relationship that, that these two religious people also happen to be the nicest people in my life. That's what they got to see. That's all you can give them. Okay? I will say this, though, as a, a, a little divergence here. There is advice given to mothers and mother-in-laws on their daughter and daughter-in-law's wedding day. That advice is sit up, shut up, and wear beige. That is great advice for grandparents. Do not say anything about the way they are raising their children unless you're asked, unless it is very clear they want to hear it because I know there are those of you in here who have been cut out of your grandkids' lives because you couldn't keep your mouth shut and your in-law was not happy about this at all. I get that in my office all the time. Your son married a lady who, well, she just doesn't like you putting your two cents in about religion and about how to raise their kids and you didn't realize she was that insecure but she is and you're thinking why is my son letting this happen because he lives with her that's why and he's got to throw in his lot and be loyal there so be very very careful my wife and I say nothing unless we are asked and then if we're asked I just cry it's so nice that you asked me <laughs> and I offer to sell him a book you know hey he is my son half price Yeah, you got to be very careful on this grandparent thing. I can't tell you how many fractured relationships, and here's why. Because grandparents right now, never has there been such a difference between religion from the grandparents' level down to the next level. Never has there been that big a difference. You know this as well as I do, which leads me into what I'm going to do that I said last night, and I said I was going to do it every night. I know there are those of you whose children have left the faith. I know that. You even, you even mentioned it, dear, and you said, where do we go wrong? I'm a failure. Somehow I missed it. What happened? And so this is a source of torment for you. You beat yourselves up. I'd like to prove to you right now that at the very least, your beating yourself up is over. It's done. Please just answer yes or no to these questions. Is there a God? Is Christ God? 
Was he sinless? Could he perform miracles? Did he have a perfect understanding of human nature? Could he get most people to follow him? Oh, you think you're better at this than the God-man. Our Lord himself couldn't get most people to follow him. Who do we think we are? Like some kind of spiritual formula? If you apply it just right, you know, all your kids should be in the faith. My wife says we're not their savior. We can pray for them. We can do everything we can to be the loving parents we can be. But I will not. And I said this last night. I just, you learn things about yourself as you get older, you know, because we're not very good at predicting how we're going to behave. You know, Thomas. Thomas said, well, well, we'll go die with him. He said that when our Lord performed a miracle with Lazarus. Thomas said, well, we'll go die with him. Well, yeah, they all ran. They all ran like cowards. And Peter, too. I'll die with you. <laughs> yeah, right. Bad prediction there, Peter. And we're not very good at predicting how we're going to react, but I learned something about myself. I learned that I'm not going to have my joy depleted by the conduct of my adult children. I'm not. I have some that make me look like God's gift of parenthood, and I got others that I, well, you just shouldn't buy my books. Just don't. <laughs> I took all their pictures out of the book. <laughs> I got one that is probably going to say, I'd like to thank the Academy for this honor. And then I got one that's probably going to say, I'd like to thank your honor for not sending me to the Academy. Tomorrow night, I'm going to talk about why I came back to the Catholic Church. And it was logic. It was logic and reason that brought me back to the Catholic Church. I can tell you this. There will be some information there that I know you've never heard. I'm pretty sure you've never heard it. So if you have folks that are wrestling with the Catholic Church, I'd like to show you as best I can that she is exactly who she said she is after I was gone for eight years. Let me close with this. I like to always tell a touching marriage story at the end. Elderly gentleman and his wife were shopping. She bends over, she picks up a can of clean peaches, tries to stick it under her coat, tries to walk out without paying. Woo! Goes before the judge. What'd you do? I, I stole a can of peaches. How many in a can? Twelve. Twelve days in the county jail then. Her husband can't believe what he's hearing. Your Honor, please, may I speak up? Go ahead. She also stole a can of peas. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow, I hope.